Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before we begin tonight's program, I have a couple of announcements. First, if you wouldn't mind starting to find your seats. Uh, we do have some open seats, so you may need to find them in the middle of the rows. Um, secondly, if you have a cell phone, please find it. And everyone thinks I do this for show, but it's on, so I'll turn mine off in the process. Uh, we want to make sure that the presenters, the audience, and the folks watching at home on our live web stream uh, get to hear what the speakers are saying and not what ringtone you have. So thank you very much for that. Uh, lastly, our chef tonight, uh, who's busy cooking Friday dinner, uh, he has prepared a special menu for this event. And it's, you may have seen it up on the uh, screens during the reception. You'll notice as you walk out, you can pick up a menu card. But in honor of tonight's event, he's uh, starting with the first course of beet salad. And then the second course with the 20-plus uh, veterans of the 8th Air Force and 100th Bomb Group we have with us. Uh, some fish and chips, but he's put his twist to it. And then lastly, we have a GI chocolate bar ganache, which is uh, sort of in honor of the Operation Chowhound and maybe what the Americans were able to introduce to their Dutch friends. So uh, thank you all for being here. And now it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Nick Mueller. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as you heard, I'm Nick Mueller, President and CEO of the National World War II Museum, and what an extraordinary night. It's just such an honor to have all of you here with us at the National World War II Museum. There couldn't be a more special group uh, to have here uh, with us. Uh, we are with the 100th Bomb Group Association for their reunion. Uh, I'd just like to ask everybody who's here, just as part of that reunion group, wave or stand up wherever you are. Let's see how many of you are here. Just as the reunion group, stand up. Look at that. <laughs> Woo! Sons and daughters, grandkids, everybody's here. And now I think we also have a number of distinguished World War II veterans uh, with you, the veterans of the 100th Bomb Group. And uh, you're, you're why we're all here, so uh, why don't uh, you stand and wave and be recognized. 100th Bomb Group members, please stand. 100th Bomb Group. And would any other veteran that's here tonight uh, stand and uh, please as well. This is a World War II museum, so any other World War II veterans who may not be with us, please stand away. Thank you, there are several here. This is your museum, and uh, I know you, you know that because you keep telling me what I gotta do next, so. <laughs> Uh, in any event, we thought this was the most appropriate venue for tonight's event, which we've been looking forward to for now for over 18 months. Here in the U.S. Freedom Pavilion, the Boeing Center. And as everyone can look all the way up there to that B-17, my gal Sal, hanging right above you, uh, you have the real deal there soaring above you, and uh, unfortunately, that plane didn't make it to England, that's why we have it here. It went down on an ice floe in uh, Greenland and was salvaged and uh, restored and hung here when we opened uh, this pavilion. Uh, so that's your plane. You get up there on that catwalk and on the second level catwalk or the top one, and we have all kinds of information about uh, the 8th Air Force and the B-17s uh, and uh, want you all to to go up there before you leave tomorrow or the next day, or the next day. I'd like to rest, recognize a few people. Fisk Canley, who's a World War II vet, friend of the museum, featured in the Tom Hanks film. Where are you, Fisk? Fisk Canley, where are you? Fisk, are you here? I thought you were supposed to be here, Fisk. Where are you? <laughs> uh, in any event, also representing the Kingdom of the Netherlands, we're honor honored to have Air Commodore Ralph Reifman, Commodore. Right here in front of me. Yeah. Uh, 
Also, the honorary consul to the Kingdom of the Netherlands here in New Orleans, uh, Ms. Connie Willems and her husband Casey. Bonnie, Connie and Casey were children during the war and were direct beneficiaries of the relief missions. Connie, would you please stand and be recognized with Casey? <laughs> Old friends of mine from the World Trade Center, and uh, so we've known each other for a long time, and it's really special to have you both uh, with us uh, for this evening. And then Ron and Carol Bailey are caretakers at Thorpe Abbott's uh, Airfield in England. They helped immensely with our Masters of the Air tour, which was led by Don Miller this past May. Ron and Carol, I don't know where you were sitting right here. Why don't you all stand up? Everybody knows you guys. Woo! I just got to take a moment to tell you that uh, it's about two years ago, uh, I was on a scouting trip for the uh, uh, Masters of the Air 8th Air Force tour that uh, I was organizing with my dear friend Don Miller and Don gave me all the stops along the way because he spent uh, about a year over there doing his research for his book Masters of the Air and he told me about all the bases and all the, a lot of bars he told me every bar I said he said well those guys went to all the bars too so you got to go see what they where they went so in any event Ron and Carol were a wonderful hosts to me uh, for a couple of days there at Thorpe Abbott, and we scouted that out as part of our tour, uh, which happened this last May. And uh, we've done probably 75 tours to the Pacific and to Europe, and uh, this is the first one uh, to England on the 8th Air Force. And our trustees and people who participated who've been on many of our tours said this was a number one best tour uh, we've ever run. And uh, of course, Don Miller led it made it even extra special, but uh, our hosts uh, from Thorpe Abbott were uh, very much a part of the secret of why that uh, went so well. And finally, we have Joanna Doolittle, noted author and speaker and granddaughter of Jimmy Doolittle, and uh, she's right here, and you please stand. And before we go any further in tonight's program, I'd like to call up Dan Rosenthal uh, to the stage. Dan, as you all know, it, head of the 100th Bomb Group. <laughs> Culmination of about 18 months of planning and coordination between our organizations, and uh, he's got a few words. Dr. Mueller, thank you. The 100th Bomb Group Foundation is honored to be a part of this extraordinary museum. And it's no wonder that you've been ranked as one of the best museums in the country, in fact, in the world. You've made it your mission to recognize and memorialize our greatest generation and do so in the most prolific and inspiring way. Our foundation shares your agenda. Our goal is to preserve the legacy of our World War II heroes, the stories of their sacrifice, their heroism, their patriotism must be shared so that our children and our children's children never forget. We thank you for embracing us and look forward to being a part of your brilliant museum for generations to come. Thank you. Let it roll. Well, and uh, I think, we're, are we streaming this live tonight or just taping it? Streaming it? Okay. So Don Miller, if you're out there, that's a thumbs up to you, buddy. <laughs> uh, we're all here, and, and uh, your great work uh, records the story of the Hunters Bomb Group and the 8th Air Force better than any historian in America. So uh, we're thinking about you, Don. And to thank you, Dan, for being here, and all of you for being here. We're often referred to as the War Museum. Uh, and while, of course, anyone who walks through our exhibits and sees the mission of this museum, there's a great deal that we display that has to do with the war. As you can see, the great uh, technology and the implements of war, of the aircraft hanging above you, tanks, the half-tracks, ambulances, the jeeps, the uh, steward out there, and our exhibits as well. Uh, but we also make clear through the personal stories that are embedded in the dog tag experience and the personal artifacts throughout the exhibits that it's part of a bigger story, it's a human story. And tonight's subject is one that shines light on the best possible light of humanity, the humanity of the Allied cause. America and 
her allies did not fight around the globe for domination uh, or territory, but rather to liberate peoples who were under the thumb of totalitarian rulers and fascism uh, from 1939 to 45. Operation Chowhound can rightly be seen as one of the signal humanitarian missions in our nation's history, which have become commonplace in the post-war world as the United States has embraced its role post-45 uh, as a superpower. The United States of America is, was, and will remain one of the most generous countries on the face of the earth. This legacy of the good that came out of the war and our country's involvement is the driving force behind the final building on this campus, which will be out here on the parade ground as you go out the door to the left, and it will fill that open spot in a few years. Uh, it's important to remember that our mission uh, is about the American story of World War II and the journey of America through that war, but there are three principal elements to that story why the war was fought, that is the background to the war, how the war was won, that is the war itself, which is very much a central feature of our exhibits. But the last leg of that mission is what it means today. So what was it all about? Why did we sacrifice over 400,000 young men in that conflict? What is the lasting legacy of that war. Operation Chowhound begins to look to that future and to America's role uh, in the war, in, in the world after the war. Uh, and so we always use World War II as we move into the liberation stories and the legacy of the war in the present day as to understand the beneficial aspects as well as the threatening aspects to our democracy, the advances of democracy and the GI Bill and the Marshall Plan, the liberation of the camps, the end of the Holocaust, uh, but all of these liberating moments are always under pressure. Uh, and that's what the Liberation Pavilion will always be about. Now it's my pleasure to call up Mark Copeland, who's on the Board of Directors of the 100th Bomb Group, to introduce and moderate tonight's program. Mark, it's all yours. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Dr. Miller, thank you so much for that wonderful and gracious introduction. And thank you, Dan, for coming up to rep represent our, uh, our foundation. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I, I welcome one and all to you uh, to this evening for our presentation on Operation Mana Chow Hound. I also would like to extend, send also a special welcome to all of you joining us throughout the world via the live stream from the National World War II Museum website. We're glad for you that you're here tonight, and uh, please relax and enjoy a wonderful show. Um, when we first developed this program and, and the idea, uh, and we approached the National World War II Museum uh, with our vision and our goal to tell the story about Operation Mana Chow Hound and the part that the 100th Bomb Group played in its success, um, I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, right from the start with this project, uh, the staff of this museum was totally on board with our ideas. Um, they have been nothing short of amazing and a true pleasure to work with. And uh, one individual that I in particular would like to recognize is Mr. Jeremy Collins. Um, I thank you for your friendship, your guidance, and your professionalism, sir. And tonight's program certainly would not be possible without you. Jeremy, thank you. I'd also like to thank the support of the uh, 100th Bomb Group Foundation, Board of Directors, and the Executive Committee. We've uh, uh, decided to do this right and all the way. And I thank you for your support on um, caveating into the introduction of tonight's key keynote speaker. Mr. Hans Odenwater and his wife Marion live in Berndrecht, Holland, which is a suburb of the great city of Rotterdam. Hans has a deep passion for telling the story of Operation Mana Chow Hound, and Hans has spent a lifetime and a successful career in, as a public educator in his hometown of Berendrecht. 
an author of 26 books with topics ranging from Royal Air Force Squadron histories to his masterwork on Operation Mana Chow Hound. Without embarrassing him too much, well, maybe a little bit, I'd also like to add that he's the recipient of the Order of the Orange, his nation's highest civilian honor in recognition for his educational endeavors and his public service. In so many words, In so many words, um, Hans holds a knighthood. So therefore, uh, it's my honor and my privilege to introduce our speaker for the evening, accompanied by his beautiful wife, Marion. Please, let's give a big American welcome to our friend, Mr. Hans Odenwater. Hans. We're going to begin uh, Hans' PowerPoint presentation with a, um, we'll just leave it at this, with the film. Gentlemen. En dan komt de dag waarop bommenwerpers uit de lucht het reddende voedsel brengen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. That was not a very pleasant way to start a presentation. Because... At the time the film was made, about 2,000 Dutch people a week were dying from hunger. And there was no food, because we had 600,000 German soldiers and civil servants in Holland, and they had all withdrawn within the occupied part of the country, and they were entitled to six Russians as compared to one Russian for the Dutch. And that meant that the 600,000 Germans would eat 3,600,000 Russians, whereas there were only Russians for 3 million Dutch people. You don't have to be a master mathematician to understand that something would go terribly wrong. I have dedicated quite a part of my life to do something that uh, came from what one of my generals in the army once said when we talked about the hunger winter and the food drops. And when we were discussing whether it would be possible in 1983 to invite American, English, Canadian, Australian, New Zealand, British and Polish veterans to come over to Holland to experience the gratitude of the Dutch. And the general said to me, I was a mere captain, so you can understand I was even sweating more then than I'm now. The general said to me, listen you, we can never pay back the mortgage, but what I want you to do is nibble on the interest. And that's what I've been doing for 35 years now. For 35 years I've been trying
with the cooperation of everybody in the Netherlands, including His Royal Highness Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, who was then the husband and later the father of our Queen, who was a tremendous help in organizing those things. And one of the events of a visit of veterans to the Netherlands was the 3rd of May, when we all went with 500 people to Suzdijk Palace to be entertained by His Royal Highness, to be doused in beer by Mr. Heineken. And I can tell you that at the end of the evening, everybody had walking problems, including His Royal Highness. <laughs> As I was the boss of the gang, I had two people to help me and support me in my walks. Okay, I have been able to write two books about Operation Mana Chow Hound. One called Operation Mana Chow Hound, of course, and one called uh, Memories of a Miracle. One book is the more scientific book, the book that tells you what happened, how it happened, and when it happened, and how much it was. And the other one was a book where people tell their experiences. Ammon, who were at first very, very suspicious, because they were told, tomorrow you are going to fly over enemy-occupied territory at 400 feet, full flaps, wheels down, very slowly, you are going to fly over German quadruple 20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns, 88s, but they are not going to shoot at you. Excuse me. <laughs> yes, because the Germans promised. Excuse me again. They have been promising things since 1939, and they haven't kept a single one. Nevertheless, on the 29th of April, the first aircraft took off, and I hope I can work with the thing, and they flew to the Netherlands to drop the first food. And that reception of the Dutch people was so amazing that when these RAF chaps returned to England, they couldn't believe what they had experienced. In 1985, when we uh, celebrated the 40th anniversary of the food drop, the 50th, I'm sorry, we made these two patches, one for the RAF people, one for the Americans, which signifies in a patch the food drops and the gratitude of the Dutch people. And what do we remember of the food drops? Well, of course, I was born exactly nine months after the food drops, and now I'm going to share something with you, which you all have to promise me. You will never tell anyone. It will not leave this building, and the general is here as a witness. My father had to leave the country rather in a hurry in 1943 because there were German officials who were not very happy with him. He was in the resistance, and you don't do that when you're occupied, you know. And when he came back, he was a temporary second lieutenant in the British Columbia Dragoons. He arrived home on the 7th of May, 1945. His father-in-law didn't recognize him and said to his daughter, come to the door, there's an Englishman who wants to say something. My father, of course, said, no, Dad, it's me. My grandfather collapsed in the corridor, and I was born on the 7th of February, 1946. Hence the story in our family that my father liberated the town of Dordrecht in the afternoon and my mother in the evening. <laughs> you just promised me to keep that between us. Is there any security here? Yes? Okay. Well, what do people remember? They kept things. When you look at the pictures, you see flour, dried beans, chocolate, dried eggs. People had no clue what it was. Yellow powder, and you put it in your mouth, and you choked. <laughs> until someone said, let's put some hot water with it, and then suddenly it turned into a pudding. And then you let it on the fire for a while, and it turned into an omelette. Bacon and dehydrated meat. No one had any idea what to do with that until someone put it in a bucket and it got wet and you could eat it. And there is one story where I must ask the ladies to put their fingers in their ears for only a few seconds. The American 
K rations also contained condoms. <laughs> well, we the Dutch, of course, as you all know, we are a very Calvinist, clean, decent people. <laughs> and there were some ministers who said from the pulpit that first, before the food went to the people, those funny round things had to disappear first. And there must have been, it happened, and there must have been someone in Holland who became a millionaire because we never found out where they went. <laughs> I'm telling you something about what I like to call the road from despair to joy. Operation Mana Chowhound and Operation Faust. Operation Faust was the Canadian way of bringing the food in with trucks after the 1st of May 45. How come the Dutch were starving? First of all, when the Allies tried to capture the bridges at Eindhoven, Nijmegen and Arnhem, as you very well know, it was a bridge too far. But the Dutch railway workers went on strike to support the Allies by denying the Germans the use of railways to transport soldiers, ammunition, tanks, and what have you, to Holland. In retaliation, the Germans said that the Dutch could no longer use trains to bring food into the west of the country. The west of the Netherlands is dairy country, but most of our cows had been stolen, and they were all speaking German by then, if they hadn't been eaten, and there was no agriculture. The second thing was that after the railway uh, after the railway strikes and the failure at Arnhem, there was a stalemate at the River Rhine. For a while, nothing moved at the front. And then, of course, came the hunger winter. The hunger winter was the winter that will be remembered by those men who took part in the Battle of the Bulge. It was one of the worst winters of the 20th century. And uh, when the Allies started entering Germany, a lot of the Allied uh, resources were being used to push into Germany rather than to liberate that little part of Holland which was under siege and where the Germans couldn't do anything. And then what happened was, of course, that Dutch society broke down. There was no food, there was no power supply, hygiene and morale fell, and within a couple of weeks, not only were the people very hungry, but the people were getting filthy. And the reason for the starvation, as you can see on this picture, I just mentioned them, but you could see how the people looked by January 1945. Especially the elderly people and the children were the first ones to die. And then, of course, the people who had no money or no goods to enter the black market and go into that black market and try to get something for their families. In fact, I told, I, told, I told some of you that people would bury members of the family who had died in the back garden so that they could use their coupon books to get some extra food for the family. In fact, in 1945, in June, July, and August, the number of funerals in Holland rose by 400% because all these dead bodies had to be dug up from the back gardens and they had to be buried decently. Well, you saw some of it on the film. People had only one way to get food and that was to go on long walks and go to farmers and ask for food or go to the soup kitchens where they uh, would make some kind of soup with a little bit of vegetable in it and some leftover pieces of meat. And then you see situations like you see in the pictures, children with no shoes. A man who has fallen down exhausted with a burlap sack of wood to burn in his house. I got three pictures of this man. This is the first one. On the other two pictures, the man is still in the same position, but the sack with wood has disappeared. Because that man was not important. The burlap sack with wood was important. And the women and the children, they were the only ones who could provide because all the Dutch people over 18 years had to go to Germany to work in the German ammunition factories, aircraft factories and what have you. And the ones who didn't want to do that, 
were called underdivers, they would hide. So a lot of the strong part of the population of the Dutch would be somewhere, but not available. And then you could see long rows of women and children standing in front of the food kitchen, hoping that the food kitchens would not close before they would come with a little pan and a little bucket to get some food. After the liberation in 1948, there was a Dutch painter, and some of them made paintings which I would like to share with you. And this painting, uh, these paintings went all over the Allied countries except Poland, of course, because in 1945, Poland, which had fought so gallantly in the Netherlands and liberated part of the Netherlands, was still an occupied country now by the communists. And I'm going to show you some of these paintings. You see members of the resistance printing leaflets and illegally listening to the BBC. Listening to the BBC could cost you your head. It was a capital punishment you would get for it. You would hide Jewish people in your house or labor refusers, people who didn't want to go to Germany to work. There was little room for our Jewish citizens to hide in forests and mountains as they could have done in Norway and as they could have done in France and in Belgium. Holland is as flat as a pancake. We have no forests, so if you want to hide people, you have to hide them in the villages and the towns. And what is simpler than to surround part of a town or to surround a complete village and then send your German troops from house to house, from house to house, and slowly collect all the people who are hiding there? We had no caves where they could go. We had no high mountains where they could go. We had nothing. And unfortunately, and it is one of the things that the Dutch are still very frustrated about, 85% of our Jewish population perished. The next one. The enemy started raiding houses to find the men and to track them, to take them to Germany for forced labor or they would block the streets to confiscate the bicycles because the Germans no longer had the oil fields at Ploesti and the Ukraine. They only had artificial fuel, and when these artificial fuel uh, dumps were bombed by the Allies, they had to go back to horse-drawn carts and bicycles. And I remember my dear mother, <clears throat> who died at the age of 92 three years ago, whenever my wife and I went to Germany, she would wish us a happy journey, and if you see my bicycle, please bring it back. <laughs> I'll never forget, soccer is a big thing in Holland, and the general knows all about it, that when we played Russia in the final, we won and we became European champions, okay, but then we played the Germans in the semi-final, and we won. Boy, the whole country was dancing on the table, and you could see a man with a big banner in his hand on the stand saying, and now I want my bicycle back. <laughs> All jokes aside, with the progress of the winter, people would start uh, bringing the trees down and hacking the wood away between the railway lines or the tramway lines in the cities. They would go scoring through garbage bin and the children would be begging for some food from the families. And don't think that these paintings were paintings because the guy had a bit too much paint and he did want to spend a happy afternoon. No, this is a reality. And then you had these hunger expeditions where the people would go to the farms and try to get food. And then you see these images. A girl, a boy and a girl. Look, the boy is bare feet and the girl is on wooden shoes. And whenever people come to Holland, and they want to have a nice time, they buy wooden shoes to take home. But in our days, a wooden, wooden shoes were things you had because of the lack of leather for normal shoes. And you see people who are starving in the streets like the man you see on the right-hand picture. Well, I'll read it for you. After receiving alarming news via His Royal Highness Prince Bernard, Her Majesty Queen Wilhelmina wrote letters of great concern to President Roosevelt, to King George, and to Winston Churchill, and she said, 
if nothing very drastically is done before the end of the war, the liberation of my people in occupied Western Netherlands will merely be the liberation of corpses. And that, of course, was a reason why General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces, was to act immediately to alleviate the starvation of the Dutch. He sent for the man who had organized tactical air warfare. Since D-Day, he sent for Air Commodore Andrew James Ray Geddes. Geddes was a British pilot who had started the war, who had been in the RAF since 1923, who had started the war as the commanding officer of Number 2 Squadron, which were flying Lysanders over Europe when the Germans started to blitz. And he was a very skillful pilot, but also a very skillful organizer. And he was a very poor negotiator. He wouldn't take crap from anybody. If he thought it was necessary, it had to be done. And if you look at the picture of Geddes as he was in 1945, it is not a guy you want to dance with, it's not a guy you want to do business with, because he wants what he wants, and he gets what he gets. And that's why Eisenhower sent him to Holland to talk to the Germans. And General Eisenhower gave him strict orders. Geddes, you are going to talk to them, you're going to tell the Germans what the intentions are, and you are not going to negotiate. Well, that's a good way to start talks with your enemy if you tell them in advance that you're not going to negotiate. And that's exactly what Geddes did. He told the Germans that three operations were being planned and they were ready to be executed. Operation Mana, being flown by the Royal Air Force. Operation Chowhound, being flown by the 8th United States Army Air Force. And Operation Faust, to be carried out by Canadian troops in Holland. So that was virtually the chain of command, and as you will see, there will be pictures of people we all know. It went from Queen Wilhelmina and King George to President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill, then it went to Eisenhower and his Chief of Staff, General Beadle Smith, then it went to Air Commodore Geddes, who, who talked to General Doolittle and Air Chief Marshal uh, Bert Harris, and then it went to the aircraft. In the meantime, the Dutch were sitting around the stove that didn't burn with three pairs of socks on their feet, hoping for the best. And then were the negotiations. I have to tell you something here that's very funny. On the left-hand picture, you see a Canadian Buick with a white flag. The Canadians have met the Germans at, in no man's land near Amersfoort, and a German general is complaining, first of all, because he doesn't want to have a white flag on the car because he hasn't surrendered yet. Then he doesn't want to be blindfolded. And what's worst of all, he has been pricked with a bayonet by a Canadian who called him Fritz. <laughs> and his name wasn't Fritz, it was probably Heinrich, but the Canadian didn't know that. Then arrives another Mercedes with a white star on it and with the bonnet closed, and that Mercedes is the private Mercedes of the German Commissioner of the Netherlands, Dr. Arthur Seis Inquart. He was the ruler of the Netherlands on behalf of the Nazis. He got the Netherlands because he betrayed his own country, Austria, in 1938 to the Germans. But the guy driving the car of Seis Inquart is not Seis Inquart, it is His Royal Highness Prince Bernhard because the Dutch resistance has stolen the car and hidden it, and when the prince arrived in Holland, they said, Your Royal Highness, you're not driving a Jeep. We have a fancy car for you. And I talked to the prince in the palace, and I said, Sir, what happened when you arrived at Achterveld in Seis Inquart's car? He said, Well, I, gave, I went to General Creerer, the Canadian commanding general, and I said, uh, Bill, can you tell me where Seis Inquart is going to get out of his car? And General Creer said, well, over there. So Bernard told his driver, park the car over there. <laughs> Bernard being a German and having been declared a traitor of his own country by the Germans in 1940, was waiting for Seis Inquart. And what I'm going to do now is not mockery, but Prince Bernhard's Dutch sounded very German. It is like you have in these funny films like uh, Sergeant Schultz, in Hogan's Hero, I hear nothing, I see nothing, I wasn't even there. <laughs> well, Prince Bernard speaks Dutch the same way. 
But he told me when Sais Inquart got out of the car, he looked at the car and he saw bloody me and he was not amused. So Sais Inquart wanted to know what happened to my car. And then Air Commodore Gedder said, it's not your car, it's the car of His Royal Highness General Prince Bernard of the Netherlands. And that was it. Okay, the negotiations took place in an elementary school at Achterveld, the St. Joseph School. And on the bottom left picture, you see Sais Inquart and his cronies leave the building after they have agreed that they will agree with the, the rules for the food drops. There's a very nice thing in this photograph because there had been orders given to the Allied military that if the Germans gave the military salute, they were allowed to salute back. However, if they gave the Nazi salute, they were to be ignored. And what you see here on the picture, the one in front is size inquart, the second one is size inquart. He lifts his right arm and none of the Allied officers are responding. Just to tell them, hey, listen, we're not doing gymnastics with you. Because, of course, it's a, it's a funny move, you know. To, then it all started. On the 28th of April, the first Lancaster aircraft were loaded, but the weather was so atrocious that they couldn't fly that day. As you see, the British used big burlap sacks. In these burlap sacks were sacks with cement bags, and these cement bags were filled with flour. And in order to make sure that the paper bags wouldn't explode on impact, they were put into these two burlap sacks that were with a sewing machine put together, and they were dropped out of the Lancasters, whereas the Americans dropped what you call K-rations, the army rations for soldiers, and I told you the story about the condoms. We don't have to tell that story again. This is a beautiful picture. The man you see standing there, the young man, is a Dutch painter. He's well known in Holland. You'll see him on the next picture. And he told me that one Lancaster came over Rotterdam, the first one, the Pathfinder of 550 Squadron. He said, and I stood on the rooftop of my house with my father's binoculars, and I gave the V sign to the pilot, he said. And when the plane came over my house, the pilot did this with his wings. He said, sir, I'll never forget. In the meantime, I met a pilot of 550 Squadron, and I always say if this story isn't true, it should be, but it is. And his name was Bernie Harris. And Bernie Harris said to me, he said, one of the things I have never forgotten, we flew over Rotterdam, and there was this tiny little boy standing on the roof of a house. At a, well, you know where the story ends. Here they are on the picture. Bernie and, and Ton Hermans, the painter, arm in arm together. On the right-hand picture, you see Bernie when he was a 21-year-old Lancaster pilot, and on the other one, you see him as he is today. And isn't it wonderful that after 70 years, as a young boy, you can meet the pilot who actually flew over your house and waved at you? This is another... <laughs> this is another uh, Dutch boy. Willem Ridder, he lives in California now. And Willem Ridder had so, f so little to put on his body that Canadian soldiers gave him a Canadian army jacket. He still has it, by the way. And he had himself photographed in 1945 after the food drops. Uh, he, he got that jacket, I think, on the 8th of May. And the last drop was on the 9th of May. And this is built today. And every time when we have a commemoration in Holland, on a zero year or on a five year, Bill comes all the way from California and he's there. And he never leaves without leaving $1,000, he said, just to cover the cost. Well, he doesn't know that it doesn't cover the cost at all, but it's wonderful. Good. To give you an idea how Holland looked at that time, you see the white part is that part of Holland that was virtually liberated and no longer under German control. By the flags, you can see that the south, the southwest of Holland was being liberated by the English. The middle of the country had been liberated by the Canadians, together with the Poles. 
and the Americans, after they liberated Eindhoven and Nijmegen, went back into Germany again. And you see that the B2 part, that was still under German control, and that was the part of the country where people were starving. And then, of course, several things were done to try and alleviate the suffering of the Dutch. At first, the blue lines you see were Swedish supplies that in February 1945 were brought to the Netherlands by three Swedish uh, cargo ships, the Dagmar Brett, the Halaran, and the Norland, which came to Delfzijl in the north. And then it had to be transported with barges to Amsterdam, and then it had to be uh, distributed among the people. It took about five weeks before that had been done because the Germans were not cooperating. Then the red lines you see, that is how the MANA flights were made in the south and the Chauhound flights slightly north of The Hague and how all the aircraft went to the uh, 11 designed drop zones as there were Rotterdam, Gouda, Ippenburg, Duindicht, the horse race course, then there was Falkenburg Naval uh, Air Station. There was uh, there was the. J <laughs> I think it's time for prayer. <laughs> there was Vogelenzang, an area where in 1937 the World Jamboree of the Scouts had taken place. There was Utrecht. There was a small airfield near Hilversum, of course, there was Amsterdam Airport, then called Schiphol, and in the north there was Alkmaar Bergen, which was an airfield for the German night fighters that would catch the planes that were trying to hit Emden, Bremen, and Hamburg. Okay, these were the zones that Air Commodore Geddes had chosen. Walhaven Aerodrome, but that had to be abandoned because the Germans had refused to take the anti-personnel mines away. And a couple of people who were going there to retrieve the food lost limbs because they stepped on these wooden mines. They were made of wood so that you couldn't find them with uh, a mine detector. And in, uh, instead of Walhaven, food was now dropped in the pastures north of Rotterdam at Ter Breggen. Then Ippenburg, Duindicht, Valkenburg, Utrecht, Hilversum, Schiphol, Vogelenzang and Bergen Airfield, and then 10 individual places where food was dropped by pilots who lost their way over Holland flying at low level, where you had to fly with uh, the cook map in your hands instead of using your compass. So there were some places. There's one wonderful report I had from a navigator of 388 Bomb Group who happily wrote that they dropped food for the starving Dutch slightly north of Antwerp. That's Belgium. Doesn't matter. <laughs> At the same time, the Canadian Army stored hundreds and thousands of tons of army rations on the road between Wageningen, which had been liberated, and the Grebbeberg, where the Germans were still in charge. So this was a kind of no man's land. You'll see more about that later. And then, of course, people would make drawings. This is supposed to be a Lancaster. It wouldn't fly very far with that configuration, but nevertheless, it's a nice picture. And that's what many of the air crew saw. People climbing, climbing on the rooftops, waving uh, pillow sheets, waving flags, which they had made with a little bit of paint. We have in our museum in Rotterdam an American flag with 14 stripes and nine white stars because they ran out of white. Beautiful flag. Uh, this tile was made, maybe some of you have ever seen it. It's not Delft Blue, but it's called Delft Green. And it shows a mother and a child waving at the aircraft. And then, of course, from the ground, many people had the last two rolls of film for their camera, which they kept all through the war until the liberation. And you get these pictures. And these are some of the statements that were made when I was doing my research. My brother was hiding in the attic listening to the BBC. He came running down the stairs and shouted at the top of his voice, they're coming, they're coming, the BBC says they're coming. And the other one says, I sat on the roof of our house and in the distance I saw little dots. They grew bigger and became aircraft. It seemed like hundreds of them and my God, it was marvelous for they flew solo, solo. And the other one, which I like a lot is, 
I had never seen father cry, not even when our sister Joanna died from hunger. Now that he stood, now he stood on the balcony of our house and the tears came running down his cheeks as they would never stop running. Well, I can, you can look at these pictures without me saying too much. You see people waving, you see the, the food coming down. Some of the air crew, and some of them have been to Holland since. Especially the Canadians were upset, because most of the Canadians were farmers, and they saw all the fertile land in the southwest of the, of the Netherlands, which had been inundated because the Germans had blown up the dikes out of retaliation. So all, the, all that fertile farmland was covered in salt water and it took about four years before you could grow a crop on it again. <laughs> Here's some more people on the rooftops. I like that remark from the guy who said to me, well, he was, uh, I think he was 95 bomb group. He said to me, I felt something wet running down my face and I told myself I was sweating. <laughs> Here you see the ration boxes coming down. They flew so low where you could actually see people riding a bicycle on one pic on the picture. And you can see that picture was probably taken after the 6th of May, because when you look to the house, I don't know if I can show that, I can't show it to you. If you look to, at the house on the right hand side, it has the flag out. And of course you wouldn't do that as long as the Germans were in control. This is Valkenburg Naval Airfield. And this Lancaster is not flying higher than, I would say, 50 feet. This is very low. I think even the general agrees that this is low. He doesn't even say so. It's that low. <laughs> and this is another picture that was made by a waste gunner of a B-17 where someone had wrote, written on his rooftop in chalk, the moment we all expected, thank you. See on the roof of the house, the big flags, the people standing in the street. This is one of the very few color photographs I have. And when you go to Rotterdam, the apartment building is still there. Maybe I showed it to you, Mark, didn't I? Yeah, it's still there. Here, the same building from another angle. And here you can see a Lancaster going pretty low. This is at Ter Breghe, and what you see on the ground, these are magne magnesium torches that they dropped to mark the target. In fact, one of the sad things of that particular food drop was that not too far away from that place was a, uh, an old farm with a thatched roof, and the farmer had been able to keep his farm together for five years, and then a mosquito of the REF roared in and dropped his magnesium flares straight through uh, the roof of the house, and while the people were cheering for the food, the, the farmer saw his farm burn down. <laughs> And then, of course, people had to try and bring the food to the road. The Germans would not bother the Dutch, but they wouldn't help. But that was because Geddes had, state, had stated to the Germans, you will not involve yourself in our operation. And, of course, the Germans took that very literal. They didn't assist in any way. Later they did, but I'll show you why. Here you see some of the food that was broken was handed out to the people who were working there to collect the food. And if you look at the picture, you see one guy with a bar of chocolate in his hand. And we did an interview with a retired colonel of the Royal Marines who had been an 11-year-old boy in 1945. 
And uh, we were interviewing him for a TV program on Dutch television, and we had to cut the, uh, the interview with him six times, because every time when the poor man wanted to talk about chocolate, he started sobbing. So then, in the end, the editor decided we will not discuss chocolate in this film. Here you see another very nice picture. In fact, in fact a coin was made in 1985 uh, uh, depicting the, the food drops, and that particular photograph was used to put on the coin. And this is one of the uh, one of the pictures that m uh, many uh, food droppers like a lot, where people have put the food together in words and it says many thanks. And like this one that says, thank you boys. And on the top picture you see all the food that came down uh, stored, ready to be distributed, because first, of course, the food had to be split into smaller portions. Because you can't give someone 20 pounds of butter because he will kill himself. People died because they, they ate two pounds of corned beef without even, you know, drinking anything they would eat. And a lot of Dutch people after the food drops, especially in Rotterdam and Amsterdam, which were the worst city as far as starving was, was concerned, would die from eating the food. This is another nice photograph of B-17s dropping food. It's in color. That's 100 bomb group B-17. It's 100 bomb group B-17. Yeah, yeah I, I, I found the flying a bit sloppy. <laughs> 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 I'm army, you know, I can say that. <laughs> I have no clue what I'm talking about. And as it says here, the unforgettable images. The, the top one is over Rotterdam. The other ones are over Amsterdam and Amsterdam Airport. And of course, the food drops gave people a morale boost. A Dutchman, a Dutchman tethered close and very skinny, screams and waves while the B-17s roar over a German guard. Frustrated by the mighty bomber snarls at the Dutchman, you can scream what you want, but they don't hear you. And with a smile, the Dutchman says, no, they cannot, but you can bloody well hear me. <laughs> and the other one that I like a lot, somewhere else, somewhere else, a German officer, angry, helpless, and secretly impressed by the many fine fortresses roaring over, says to the waving Dutchman, da is dein verdammtes Essen, there's your bloody foot. With a smile, the Dutchman replies, yes, when they come for you, they throw something else. <laughs> and then one of my own observations in 1995, during a garden party at Susdijk Palace, Heineken Brewery sent two large trucks with beer. Very much was consumed by the veterans and His Royal Highness Prince Bernard alike. After all the veterans stumbled back into the buses, his Royal Highness was here to say they may not fly anymore, but they still know how to deal with the beer. And then His Royal Highness walked away, a real veteran between his ADC and his private secretary, giving a wonderful impersonation of a sober gentleman. In one of the buses, and I'm not revealing his name, a wise American wife who shall remain unknown said to, to her very tired husband, I know you were impressed by His Royal Highness, but there was no reason for you to call him His Holiness all the time. <laughs> okay, I'm going to show you a few photographs of Operation Faust. As the Germans had not legally surrendered at that time, all the Canadian trucks were carrying a white flag, a flag of truce. And all the food was bring, being brought to that particular road in no man's land between liberated Wageningen and occupied Rhenen. And as you see at first, the food was guarded by Dutch SS troops. Don't think that the SS was only German. In the SS there were Finns, Norwegians, Danes, Dutch, even French-speaking Wallonians from Belgium. And at the end, of course, there were even Muslims within the SS that were sent 
to, uh, to help Hitler through the Mufti of Jerusalem. And here you see a Dutchman who is to drive the car into occupied territory, looking at the German as if he's going to say, what the hell are you going to tell me, you nitwit? I mean, he wouldn't have done that 10 weeks earlier. And then this is a beautiful picture. Now the food is being controlled by the Dutch resistance. They are the guys with the helmets and the stun guns. And the guys who are carrying the food are the men in uniform without a weapon, German soldiers. Because after the Germans surrendered, we told them, you're going to be the mules now. Which was not according to the Geneva Convention, but you know, we were civilians, the Dutch resistance, we didn't know that. This is another very nice picture of all the American Russians having come down. American Russians with all kinds of treats like biscuits, butter, chewing gum, lucky strike, and camel cigarettes for daddy. And these bars of black, delicious soldier, uh, chocolate. And the British supplies, lovely spam. To you, spam is the lowest of the lowest meat and the cheapest there is. Whenever Marjoanne and I go to America, and we don't do it anymore because she passed away, we bought a tray of 16 tins of Spam for my mother. And then the first, the first tin, she would invite her lady friends. And my mother, of course, who was presiding over it, would open the tin as if she was opening the Holy Grail, <laughs> then turn it over and put the Spam on a plate and then get a knife and cut it into square pieces and put little Dutch flags in it. And then it would go around and if I would take something, she said, you're 1946, you wouldn't know what it is. <laughs> but it's amazing, I mean, to you, spam is not really a kind of meat where you dream of to have it on Saturday evening in a fancy restaurant, but for my mother it was. And then the name Operation Manor. It says in the book of Genesis, the house, in the book of Exodus, I'm sorry, the house of Israel called it manna. It was white as coriander seed, and the taste was that of honey wafers. And look at the children, especially at the little girl on the left. You can see in her face that she suffers from eudema because her face is all swollen up at the cheeks. And look at the little boy who has this American ration box on his knees, and the boy is so happy, he hardly knows what he's doing. Well, after the first trial visit in 82, the Food and Freedom Foundation organized many reunions, and here you see some of the images of the reunions that took place. I won't show these pictures too long because they're not World War II, but still, it was wonderful in 1985, we found Air Commodore Geddes, and we got him in touch with uh, Prince Bernhard again. And when he came to Holland for the manor commemorations, the prince insisted that the air commodore would come in his uniform, which he did. And I will never forget, we were at the barracks, uh, the Air Force barracks in The Hague, and uh, the commander in chief of the Royal Netherlands Air Force, General Manderveld, who was then, you probably remember the name, who outranked the Air Commodore by about a mile, stood to attention in front of the Air Commodore and said, Sir, I salute you. And I thought that was wonderful. And here you see Geddes walking through the crowds, how he's being cheered by people, very proud wearing his American Legion of Honor, Legion of Merit, I'm sorry. And when he was leading his boys, as he used to call them, through the streets of The Hague. And the other picture, the one over there, that's another picture with a story. The man on the left with the cap is a Dutchman who doesn't speak a word of English. And the man on the left is an American navigator who doesn't speak a word of Dutch. And the Dutchman says, Dank you well, dank you well, dank you well, which is thank you, thank you, thank you. And the American says, it's okay, it's okay. And everybody was crying, me including. It was so emotional at times. And of course, hey, the British people have a, a peculiar sense of humor. Well, he was being hugged, he said, if you keep on hugging me like this, when she said, saving my life, I may very well lose mine. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the pictures made at uh, Suzdijk Palace.
and this was the uh, the parade because they would uh, they would march past Prince Bernard, and on the on the right you see General James Jameson, who was then Commander in Chief, United States Air Force Europe, and uh, you see uh, Air Marshal Phil Sturley, you see General De Vere, who was then the Inspector General of the Armed Forces, there is General Frans Caillot of the Dutch Army. Behind him is uh, Colonel Eric Johnson, the American Air Force attaché, and there's Prince Bernard, and the little guy in the background is one of the valets. <laughs> hmm? I'll watch my time. Yeah. Here you see them doing a parade past the prince. This is the monument remembering Operation Manachawant, and as you see, in the yellow food boxes, you see the silhouette of a B-17, and the other one is the silhouette of a Lancaster. I'll quickly, here you see that monument. The monument was unveiled by the son of Air Commodore Geddes, Angus, his grandson, who is a lieutenant colonel in the Australian Army, and his great-granddaughter. The road leading to the monument was called the Air Commodore Geddes Path, and now I'm going to show you, and then I'll try to stop because Mark tells me I'm talking too long. Uh, some of the nice pictures that were made to remember the food drops and to express our country's gratitude. A photograph of the Lancaster flying over. Here's the Lancaster dropping poppies. And then, of course, you had the Berlin airlift. And it has done many more times since, of course, in other countries where people were starving. So now you see the total tonnage that was being dropped. Most of it was uh, dropped at Rotterdam. They flew 5,500 sorties, and they dropped approximately 11 tons of food. With Lancasters, that could, could uh, carry 2.1 tons, and the B-17s could carry 1.8 because they had more people on board, they were ha more heavily armed, and they, were, uh, they had armor, which the Lancaster didn't have. This is the poor crew who lost their lives during the food drops of, of um, the group of uh, uh, Lieutenant Skirman. They, uh, they were hit by renegade Germans who were shooting at them, and they tried a forced landing, a ditching of the British coast, and they failed. And 11 out of the 13 crew members perished. On the left, you see your commander-in-chief and our commander-in-chief, His Royal Highness of His Majesty the King. It gives you the quantity of food that was dropped. As you see, the, uh, the British dropped 7,033 tons, the Americans 4,155 tons, and the Canadian trucks brought in some 8,500 tons. Aircraft that were being used were a total of 5,764 aircraft, which is quite a lot. And then as far as the missions of your group is concerned, it's um, Amsterdam Airport on the, uh, when I, I, on the 1st of May, Valkenburg Air Base near Leiden, where they dropped 71 0.7 tons, then Amsterdam Airport, 76.7 tons, Bergen, the airfield near Alkmaar, 37.7 tons, Hilversum, the same. Then on the 4th of May, there were no US drops due to the poor weather. Then Bergen, 37.7. Then a part of the food that was intended to be dropped at Bergen was dropped at Baar near Utrecht, 7.4 tons. All in total, the B-17s of 100 bomb group dropped 401.7 tons. These are all the participating units. One group, three group, and number eight path from the group, the 13th, the 45th, and the 93rd combat wings. And this is a very nice picture. Look at the girl. The shoes are too big and so is the smile. Wonderful picture. And some of the veterans were the, the lady who probably, she wasn't that girl, but she could have been. So, I would like to finish by saying I speak for all the people of the Netherlands. 
when I say thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Hans, for that terrific presentation. Um, I, uh, I'd ask uh, just a favor from uh, Dante and maybe a couple of other uh, younger gentlemen. We want to get our veterans up on stage in the, uh, in the interim here before we start the next portion of our program. Um, thanks, Jeremy. As we, uh, as we bring up our, uh, our veterans here, I want to point out one thing that uh, you... Yeah, yeah. As we uh, bring them up, uh, I just wanted to point out one thing and personally thank uh, Mr. Jack O'Leary um, from the great state of Massachusetts that uh, was a, uh, brought some amazing things. His father flew several of the food drop missions, and over here on stage right, he brought some remarkable uh, uh, artifacts and some history about his, his uh, family's connection on Operation Market Garden. Jack, thank you for all your trouble, and thank you for uh, honoring your father, sir. And um, one more thing about Hans. Um, in researching this thing, um, I went, to, uh, I went to, to Holland and was the guest at the uh, Odenwater residence for about four days. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell something about Hans. Um, I'll tell you, the one thing I found out in, in, in spending the time with him, um, do you know the greatest thing about Hans? I'll share it with you. The greatest thing about Hans Odenwater, well, she's standing right there in the red dress, and that's his wife, Marion. Marion, thank you very much for all your trouble to come over. So, on to the next portion of our program. Hey, where did you guys come from? Oh, great, all right. <laughs> Hansi did a brilliant job, once again, for telling the uh, broad story of the Operation Mana Chow Hound. Um, however, for our next portion of the program, we're going to narrow that down a little bit, and we're going to focus on the part played by the 8th Air Force, the 3rd Air Division, and most in particular, the 100th Bomb Group. So how are we going to do that? Tonight, I'm very proud to say that we have three gentlemen from the 100th Bomb Group that actually flew the Chow Hound missions. They're going to share a portion of their experiences with us tonight, but before I properly introduce each one of them, uh, I have a real special treat. Um, and uh, this is a special film that we composed uh, just for this evening. Um, I, sh I shouldn't take any, any re uh, real credit for it. The true credit goes to our, uh, our rock star, Mr. Mike Faley, and uh, his assistant, Mr. Vince Edwards. This is six and a half, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> This is, a, uh, this is a six and a half minute film that uh, ex uh, actually contains some very, very rare color footage. A lot of this, ladies and gentlemen, has never been seen before. Um, the other thing is, as I should caution you, as Hans did, is that um, there's graphic scenes in the film. It's sometimes very tough to watch as a father, um, but sometimes the horrors of war have to be told. So gentlemen, Please, if you may.
On April 20th, 1945, the 100th Bomb Group flew its last combat mission. On the 25th of April, 1945, the 8th Air Force flew its final mission in the conflict. During the Operation Chow Hound, Operation Mana, Food Drop, Humanitarian Missions, the 100th Bomb Group flew a total of eight missions from May 1st to May 8th of 1945 and accounted for the successful delivery of over 430 tons of food to the starving Dutch civilians. We're very fortunate tonight to have three of our special 100th Bomb Group veterans that took part in the Chow Hound food drop missions. These gentlemen here on stage will share their memories here for a short while about those days in 1945. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our veterans. To Hans's right, Mr. Joe Carl Martin, who was an aircraft commander, first pilot, 349th Bomb Squadron. His airplane, his airplane was easy going. He flew a total of 26 combat missions and was credited for three Chow Hound missions and two POW repatriation missions. To, uh, yeah. to Joe's right, we have Mr. James Johnson. Johnson, excuse me. Jim was also an aircraft commander, first pilot, in the 351st Bomb Squadron. He completed 19 combat missions and was credited with two Chow Hound missions. And this, along with his wonderful family, this is Jim's first 100th Bomb Group reunion. Welcome, Jim. And lastly, on the far right, this is a pretty special deal. Joe Carl Martin and Hank Cervantes have something in common because they were pilot and co-pilot. Hank Cervantes was a co-pilot in the Martin crew alongside Joe Carl, flew 26 missions and also was credited for three Chow Hound missions and two POW repatriation missions. Um, also, I should add, Hank had a very, very celebrated career in the United States Air Force and um, was, uh, had, a, had a long flourishing uh, influence on our today's Air Force. And uh, Hank, it's a pleasure to have you up on stage, sir. Thank you. So let's, um, let's start off and just kind of do this in, a, in, in kind of a little bit of a manner. We had kind of a discussion last night and I had a couple things that um, uh, I thought were, were, were definitely interesting for the audience here tonight. But let's start off uh, in the middle here with Jim, or for anybody that wants to, uh, to jump in. Um, so here are these airplanes that are now turning from weapons of war to now an aircraft that's converted to, for humanitarian efforts and food drops. Can you share with the audience, Jim, some of the things that the ground crews had to do, in other, in other words, to convert the airplanes to complete the mission? Well, I think the thing I can remember the most, I, I can't hear you too well off, off here to the side, but the thing I remember the most is we were not told that there was a truce. We sort of assumed that there was, and now that I find out that there wasn't. It's, <laughs> it's, it's scarier now than it was then. <laughs> All right, we can caveat that on um, Joe Carl or Hank. Um, can you describe in terms of uh, your, your formations and what it was like to fly with uh, with on these missions. It wasn't a high altitude mission that, were, that you were used to. It was described to the audience what it was like to, to, uh, to approach the coast of Holland, the altitude, the speed. It was quite unusual. We flew in at 500 feet across the country. And when we got to the drop zone, we dropped at 300 feet. That was our orders. We did what we were told. And it was like I say, very unusual. The people was lined up, we could see their faces. And what worried me were some of them run out to pick up some of those boxes while I was dropping. And I really worried me. And I don't know if any of them got hurt or not, because I didn't get to see behind me. That's 
Great. Hank, what do you recall? Did, were the, were the uh, as you flew over the food drop zones, did you fly in an echelon formation or single file? We flew single file, and I had an unusual experience. My plane stalled at 120 miles an hour, and that's the drop speed. <laughs> but I was able to catch it with the throttles and kept it from going down <laughs> and drop the food at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Hank, do you have any memory? Hank, do you have any memory of that incident? Let me tell you something about co-pilots. <laughs> <laughs> In a very authoritative voice, they say, "Flaps up, gear up, flaps down, I can't hear you. gear down." Otherwise, in a very humble little voice, they say, yes, sir, and no, sir. <laughs> so I have nothing to add. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> now I think we can see why Hank had such a successful military career. <laughs> Thank you, Hank. Um, yeah, the, the Dutch civilians. Can anybody, uh, I'll just kind of throw this as a jump ball. Do you remember seeing the Dutch civilians or anything that kind of stood out in your mind? Or even you were telling me about flying over some of the, the towns and the cathedrals, the cathedrals that you were flying over? Talking or flying, yeah, any, anyone. Yes, we flew through, uh, through France and, and all, and we seen several cathedrals. We were down below the top of the things. Yeah. We could see them very well. Because 500 feet is not very much <laughs> from, from one of those things. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim, Jim in the middle is having a little trouble hearing. I'm going to speak up a little bit, Jim. Can you hear that okay? Uh, not really, but go ahead. Okay. <laughs> you approached the Dutch coast, and as you mentioned, you, found, you didn't know if the Germans were going to honor the truce or the supposed truce and not shoot at you. But you came over the coast and described to the audience, you saw the German flak guns and what were they doing? Well, I think I heard what you said. Uh, one of the things you gotta remember when you're dealing with antiques, one of the things that we lose first is our hearing. <laughs> uh, we just assumed that they weren't your no, no. And Joe says he went in at 500 feet. I went in at considerably lower than that. I think we were right on the deck, and we realized we didn't want to get in any trouble in that kind of an environment, so we added a foot or two here and there, but fundamentally we were on the deck most of the way. And you could see the gunners sitting there, and you just hope they keep sitting there. <laughs> yeah. Joe or Hank, do you remember that? Looking down at those gunners, and what were they doing? They were pointing at you. They looked like, uh, excuse me, those gunners look like duck hunters waiting for the season to open. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Joe, do you, do you remember that very vividly. What was what did you think about that as far as the German gunners? Well, it was kind of worrying that we, we were told they would not shoot at us, but they tracked us with those guns, and I kept my eye on them, and I was hoping they wasn't going to shoot them. That's all I could do was hope. Looking above us in a B-17, pretty much all of us know that there were 10 crewmen aboard. However, on the Chowhound missions, you didn't fly with a full crew. No, we did not. It was a voluntary thing. And, and usually, uh, anyone, how many, how many uh, crew members were actually on the airplane? Pilot, co-pilot, navigator? I remember, Henry, how many flew? We had a pilot, co-pilot, navigator, no gunners, no bombardiers. Uh, the reason for that was uh, General Eisenhower uh, didn't want to uh, 
attacked the garrisons, the German garrisons that were in Holland, because he was afraid if he did that they would break the dikes and flood the country. On the other hand, the German uh, general didn't want us to get up any higher than 400 feet because it, he was afraid if we got any higher that we would be able to bomb his positions. And so that was the basis for the truths. Very good. Should we do a little Q&A? What do you think, Jeremy? We have all time for that? We're going to give you folks an opportunity to uh, maybe ask a couple questions of the veterans up here. Um, Jeremy is going to walk around like Phil Donahue. And, um, and if anybody would like to raise their hand to ask a question, please. Eric Commodore. First of all, uh, gentlemen, my respect to you, what you did for my country, for the starving Dutch population. Missions before you flew this, you were dropping bombs on an enemy. Now you were delivering food to starving population. Was that emotionally enlightening for you? How did you feel about dropping food? Thank you. you want to answer? Did Anybody everyone want to take that one? That? The question is, previously you had been dropping bombs to destroy, kill, and maim. This was to drop food to save, to feed, for good reasons. Was this emotionally uplifting? Did this have a different feeling on this mission than on previous combat missions? Death is nothing to, to be proud of participating in. After seeing all those uh, pictures today that verify that, it's heartwarming to sit up here and be able to celebrate helping people. Thank you. God bless you. Well said, Hank. We. We literally didn't have any idea of the magnitude of the program, but it goes without saying that it was very gratifying because you could see the reaction of the people uh, waving, uh, saluting in, in their own way, and it was, uh, it was a gratifying experience, to say the least. Nice to see you, Joe, do you have any comments on that? What's that? Do you have any comments? I think they covered it pretty well because uh, it was an in lifting up experience to see the people that was waiting on, on the food. And it, 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 it was quite a different from dropping bombs on people because we knew what we were doing. We didn't want to, but we had to. Very good. Thank you, sir. How about another question? Anybody in the front row? Dante. Gentlemen. Uh -oh. What did you say oh for? <laughs> Looking at the future that we have before us, you men sacrificed more than any of us could ever repay. What words for my generation my son's generation, do you have for us of the world that we're entering into with the political climate that it is, our nation taking a back seat in a weakness that we've never seen in the last 30 years, what do you see? You saved us. What are your words for us? Do you have words for today's generation, for my generation, that certainly have not gone through what you all did 70, 70 plus years ago? Uh, what do you have to tell us who will never encounter what you all did? Uh, that's, that's paraphrasing, but I, I, we get this question often because today is so different 
than 10, 20, 70 years ago. Hank? It's very difficult to sit up here and be looked upon, if you will, as heroes. We're not heroes. We're doing what we had to do under the circumstances. And most of you would do the very same thing. Death, or excuse me, war has killed more, destroyed more, cost more than any other act in history. And we're headed in that direction again. We're just about to duplicate what has already been proven to be a, the wrong way to solve problems. Okay. What you, Jim or Joe, do you have any comment on that question? Okay. This, this is a question we get often, and, and this answer, um, one of my, basically my adoptive grandfather who volunteered here, he was a paratrooper at Normandy, gave the exact same answer, that uh, this generation would do the same. I don't believe it, um, having being a part of that generation, but it is humbling to hear that, that it is something that you had found yourself in. Um, do, do the other two gentlemen have anything to say as to how, how we would respond if we were to find ourselves in a situation of totalitarianism through Europe, through Asia, or through the Middle East as we do today? Let me say this. I was in the Strategic Air Command for a great number of years. I began when we began dropping bombs very much as what they look very much as they did in World War II. When I left, we were, I was in the B-58s, which is a supersonic bomber, and we couldn't put enough bombs on that airplane because, because we just couldn't put it and keep, and, 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 and keep going as fast as we had to go to get away from our enemies, the Russians, at the moment. There's, a, I keep repeating the same thing. We're not going to solve anything by, by, by these battles. Believe me, we're not. Thank you, Hank. Gentlemen to your right. I'd like to ask the writer, why were the Germans so cooperative? Were they at the point at that time, were they about ready to give up while they were so cooperative in this operation? Because we've heard so much in the history that, you know, the Germans were so hard and cruel, but it seems like they just backed down. And I'm just wondering, in your opinion, what, were they thinking that it was about to end for them? They, first of all, they were not backing down or anything. Uh, the reason why the Germans hardly interfered with what they called negotiations and what the Allies called directions was because they very well knew that, first of all, Adolf Hitler was dead. They also knew that Germany was about to come to an end as a nation. And they knew it would be split up between the victors, the Russians, the Americans, the Britons, and the French. And a lot of the German generals who were in Holland, also the politicians who were in charge in Holland, thought that, that by not interfering with the uh, supply of food to the Dutch, it would give them some credit. So in a way, it's like a thief who says, if I don't rob you, you must be very grateful to me. And that's basically what he did, what size inquart never expected. 
when he uh, said, okay, we are not going to, uh, to hinder the full drops, was that a couple of months later he was swinging on the end of a piece of rope in Nuremberg. Don't forget that Arthur Seizinkwart, the governor of the Netherlands, was the only German civilian ruler who was hanged as a war criminal. The German Reichskommissar in Denmark was sent to jail. The Norwegian Reichskommissar committed suicide. The one in Belgium was told to off to Germany. And Seis Inquart, who was not only uh, the Reichskommissar, but he was only also in charge together with the Rauter of the SS, had committed so many atrocities in Holland that he was going to be treated as a war criminal anyway. The thing was that after the, uh, the conclusion of the agreement for the food drops, he jumped into an e-boat and went to Kiel and tried to get a job within the new German government of Dönitz. You know, the government that was in charge for a couple of days. And when the government of Dönitz uh, declared the surrender of Germany as a nation and as armed forces, he expected to be treated as one of the government officials. Rather than that, he was handcuffed, taken to Holland, handed over to the Dutch and locked up. So the Germans made a grave mistake by thinking that by allowing the Allies to drop food, they could expect some lenience from the Allies. But as I said, as there were no negotiations, there was no way they were going to earn anything out of it. But it had nothing to do with German kindness, no. Hmm. It also meant that they didn't have to feed the Dutch. Uh, Does that sure answer your question? Before we get to our next question, if you all could turn around and look at me with my orange folder. Uh, I have Mr. Jack Coop, who's one of the veterans with the 100th. He was showing me his logbook, his actual logbook, which is a uh, priceless artifact, saying that on May 1st, 1945, he dropped supplies at Leiden, Holland. So he too is part of the Operation Chowhound oh, mission. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy. Jack. I just want to say that uh, it was a great feeling not to be dropping bombs on someone and giving them help and feeding them. And I really enjoyed doing that. It was something I, that uh, I would rather do is to help someone than drop bombs on them. So that, that's all I've got to say. So. Well, it was well said. Thank you, Jack. Motion to the right gentleman. Gentlemen, thank you. Dank u wel. Ook. Goedenavond. It's, it's easy to hear the kind of simplified version of these generals negotiated and the next thing this squadron took off. Do you guys have any personal recollection of first getting the word, hey, we're going to go drop food? What was that? Scuttlebutt? The officers club? Mission briefing? Obviously, there was some preparation, but how did you hear for the first time we're going to go drop food over Holland. Did you gentlemen catch the question? I, I'd like to uh, respond to that, if I may. Please. Uh, we were called uh, uh, to uh, report to uh, operations for another mission. We had no idea it was to be a food drop mission. And uh, on the board that had the particulars for the mission, it said that the flight altitude would be uh, 400 feet or below. And some uh, co-pilot in the, in the place shouted out, hey, look how low we're flying this one. Even the colonels will want to go. How about you? <laughs> Jim or Joe, do you have any comment on that? Thanks, Jeremy. Well, actually, the first time I ever heard of it 
was when we got called in to a briefing and said, this is what we're going to do. Yeah. That's and we so we went yeah. out, cranked up the engines, and went and did it. Very good. Jeremy, over here on uh, this side. Got one gentleman here sure. first, and then I'll get over to the right side. Am I on? Yes, I am. Yes, Thank you. <laughs> uh, how many 100th Bomb Group people also flew Chow Hound missions during that time? Raise your hand, please. Any others? <laughs> well, I, I flew only one, as that gentleman back there may have only flown one, and I was a radio operator and not an officer. Uh, so I think uh, a, a top turret gunner flew, engineer that is, and a radio, they were required. But uh, it was indeed, at the time I flew it, and I think anybody else, it was maybe the greatest thrill of our lives. And except maybe one, I also went to Linz, Austria, and picked up, th I flew, the pilots flew, I, I rode along. So uh, I used two chauffeurs every time I flew, the, the pilot and the co-pilot. But at any rate, uh, went to Linz, Austria, picked up 30 Frenchmen, uh, slave laborers, as, as it were, and flew them back to Chartres. That was also a great, great experience. And I remember that more than I do the missions. I flew just 19, but that was, that was enough. And I do appreciate what the gentlemen were saying up here, and every bit of what they're saying is true, and maybe even more so. And I'm so, uh, as, as wonderful as I felt, and I've written it up in my memoirs. I feel it more so now, tonight, since I've heard of all of this. It's great. Thank you. Thank you, Al. We're, um, we're back right. to uh, one more question. Actually, um, you know, the uh, Paul, yeah. Paul Andrews, ladies and gentlemen, over here, just a very quick announcement from him. Um, he's worked very hard on a, on a project for, for the 100th Bomb Group. Paul is one of the most renowned historians of the 8th Air Force in the world. Paul, please. Okay. Just, a, just a few comments. First of all, I do archival research, so I look at paper, and I've thumbed through paper, and it's interesting, okay? But hearing what Mark had to say and sort of leading this panel, what Hans had to say, and what the other three gentlemen, whose names I can't remember, because I have gray hair too, like most of us here, that brings the emotion to the paper. And again, Hans, I've read your books, but hearing what you had to say and seeing your pictures, right here, I feel it. And I think everyone else here feels what you felt and experienced in doing the research. And gentlemen, for the missions you flew, and for all the other folks here who flew missions, I appreciate all that you do. And there was a project I worked on with Mike Faley, who's going to be putting this on the uh, foundation's website, basically doing a, a operational record of all the missions flown by the, the 8th Air Force, Fort Chowhound, which planes flew, who were the pilots. And there are bits and pieces missing, and hopefully you folks can fill them in when you look at this online. Thank you very much. And Thank you, Paul. These Jeremy, the... Uh... Jeremy, the last question, or the last comment, I think, um, I, I didn't know this until 24 hours ago. And um, we have a very special guest that, that uh, uh, Dr. Mueller pointed out. And I would just like to ask Connie and Casey, or Casey, um, Billums, who were children in Holland, to take the last, not question, but last comment. My name is Connie Willems. I was born in the Netherlands, and uh, usually I don't talk about my age, but uh, I, I will divulge it to you a little bit tonight. I was born during World War II, and uh, I lived with my family in Utrecht. Uh, you have seen the name up on the screen several times today. Uh, my family was there uh, in the hunger winter, 
And so was, of course, I and my older brother, my little brother, was born in May 1945. Um, after the surrender of Germany, uh, we were able to get uh, medical help uh, because of my family. My grandmother with uh, my aunt was 18. They hitchhiked uh, with the soldiers on tanks and jeeps, whatever they could get. And if you ever have to hitchhike in a war zone, be sure that you have an 18-year-old beautiful girl with you. <laughs> <laughs> because they did end up at uh, my hometown in Utrecht. In any event, uh, the doctors told my mother uh, that if the war had lasted three more weeks, both my brother and I would be dead because of hunger. So I want to thank every one of you, not only the people that have flown, but also the family, uh, down to second and third generation. I want to thank you for all the efforts you've made to liberate Holland. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you. I'll add only a couple of words, but here come Jan Alders, who's a little bit older than I, and he, I'm sure, wants to say something, don't you? Uh, I was born in 36, and uh, what parents did at that time was hide the, the terrible things that happened during the war. And personally, I never saw any of those drops because I'm from Nijmegen, the bridge too far, many people will know that. Uh, but my parents sent me back to the family and we lived on a farm for eight and a half months. So we were spared, but everything that I see here or saw here, I can relate to because it really did happen. And I also feel that I'm, I'm personally very thankful. My wife and I immigrated here in 67 and it's most probably next to marrying her, was the best thing I ever did in the world. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. well, I never would think that this occasion took place and that I'm sitting in front of a guy that flew over Holland at, at that time and that I could shake his hand in person. In the end of the war, the, the Dutch were hungry, the Germans were hungry. We had Germans in our house occupying. They didn't have anything to eat either. And they quite <laughs> didn't know what to do because they were very unpopular. So the fight for food required cunning and invention. People were growing food, making things to eat that nobody would have thought. We were making bread out of tulip bulbs. And it's gooey, I can tell you. But, and, and it really sits. And the other thing is to make delicious little chips out of uh, snippet sugar beet. You know, it really, can really get great if you're hungry. But as a whole, I can tell you that there were very few people that were sick because they were overweight. There were no fat people around. It was, it was amazing. And all kinds of the, uh, diseases disappeared. But for sure is that you get the idea what it is not to have any food. And what you see there, uh, the, uh, these people walking with a cart, I can remember at 14, 15, we had to go out and, uh, and go out to farms for, to see if we could get food. And uh, like these three women you saw in the picture, we had three women that spent the night in a farmhouse, but they had an old man with them out from The Hague. And they walked all the way from The Hague, crossed the rivers to back in Zutphen, that is on the other eastern part of the country. The man had died. So here over the night, it was freezing. It was a very cold winter, you remember. 44 was awful. Uh, we, we were sleeping in straw with the cows eating the straw from our, our, our feet. And the next morning when we got up, the cart is gone with the bag of potatoes and grandpa. So whoever stole that cart, was, a, was two wheels, had wound up when it got daylight and had a, a dead body and a bag of potatoes. And those things w would happen at, at the time. We had to walk. People walked from all over the country to try and find food. And so what, we were forever welcome because we saw those planes up in the air, 2,000. One time we saw 2,000. This is the Schweinfurt flight. 
all these B-17s up there and then figure that 10% of them didn't, didn't come back. They fell all over the place, these B-17s. So we were wondering what you guys were like. You there, you're one of them. So we thank you very much. Yeah, we, uh, thank, thank you, you very thank much. Thank you three for sharing your stories. Martin, yeah. does Hans have a? Yes, um, thank you very much, sir. Hans has um, something that he uh, holds very special um, to his organization in Bedrin directed and around the Rotterdam area with the, uh, um, the association that he uh, uh, is chair of. And he has a special presentation that he would like to give to the three veterans. Hans? A gentleman in 1995, when it was 50 years ago that the food was dropped, my country gave to the food droppers who were then present in the Netherlands a few gifts to uh, express our gratitude and uh, to express how deeply we are still today grateful for your, what you have done when you were a young man. One of the things we did, we made a special tie, which is known in Holland as the Chow Hound tie. Only 500 of them were made, and uh, being the chairman of the Food and Freedom Foundation, and always having been in my military time a kind of a wheeler dealer, I was able to make sure that a few of the ties stayed in my house. Thou shalt not steal. I know. I'm so glad I did it, because now I can give one to you. I can give one. Can you please do it, darling? And then for those of you who might still have the urge to fly and put on your Irving jacket, I also have this beautiful patch called Operation Chow Hound. So, Mama, if you would... Ma, listen to yeah. me. <laughs> if you could please give them to the gentleman. <laughs> yes, yes, my boy. Yes, Papa. I know exactly, yes. I know exactly where I stand in Thank my you. family. <laughs> Thank you. In this year, we celebrated the food drops for the very last time because, first and foremost, you gentlemen, with all due respect, you don't do the 100 meters in 10 seconds anymore. Neither has your high jumping improved since a long time. So we decided it was time uh, to agree that we had to stop. And for that reason, we did what you saw in the photograph. We made a special Batch, and the batch shows the American food drop patch and the British one. And in the middle it says, thank you, boys. And that's what I would like, like to say to you. Thank you, boys. Thank you, Hans. I'd like to close the uh, symposium with these remarks. And this goes to... Oh, okay. And with, uh, even though I know that you're Dutch, is somewhat less than my English. We had three, three books with us, which are in Dutch, but the pictures say enough, and I would like to give them to All you right. as well. Thank you, Hans. As I mentioned, um, I'd like to close the symposium with these remarks, and this goes to everyone in our 100th Bomb Group family. Um, yes, the 100th Bomb Group will forever be known and proudly known as the Bloody 100th. And rightly so. They were one of the greatest fighting forces this nation has ever seen and, for, and forever will be known as defeating, as part of the, the, of, of the uh, defeat of the worst tyranny the world has ever seen. However, let it be known that the history of the 100th Bomb Group in World War II did not end in yet another act of war. It did not end in death and destruction. There was enough. It ended with a humanitarian effort. The 100th Bomb Group left its World War II post in a massive effort not to destroy human life, but to preserve it. To our veterans on stage, your endeavors during Operation Mana Chow Hound saved what is estimated to be over three million lives. Dutch children 
not yet born, are already forever in your debt. Your efforts was the first real aid to begin the rebuilding of Europe. And today, your efforts still are in tow with the peace and freedom that the, uh, that the nations, all the European nations enjoy today. To me, that's total victory. After all, wasn't that what you were fighting for? Ladies and gentlemen, will you please join me in thanking the gentlemen on stage, our veterans from Operation Chowhound Manor. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. To close out the show, um, we're very fortunate to have, as Dr. Muller mentioned early in the evening, Miss Jana Doolittle, the, the, uh, the uh, granddaughter of General James H. Doodle, Doolittle, who was commander of the 8th Air Force at the time of Operation Chowhound. I'm just going to introduce Jana, and I'm just going to let her tell, tell you what this um, closing uh, pieces. So, Jana, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me start by saying how honored I am to be with the veterans of, of the 100th. And, um, you know, Granddad had lots of boys, and, and he felt very strongly that the 8th was, was one of his victories, or one of our victories. At the end of the war in Europe, my grandfather took the 8th Air Force over to Okinawa to prepare for the invasion of Japan. Shortly after he got there, he wrote a letter to my grandmother, and I'd like to close this with a letter that he wrote in his words. Dearest Joe, took a jeep ride up to the north end of the island Thursday and looked over the military government installations. They are handling over 200,000 natives. Many are still coming in from the hills, and most of these are in pretty bad shape from malnutrition. Quite a few are non-reversible, and even with the best of medical care, soon succumb. Horribly infected battle, battle casualties are still being brought in. Many of these are children. Most are the handiwork of bombardment. It is distressing to realize, how that, realize that only two military services are constructive the medics, and the engineers. All the rest of us are destructive. I saw a little six-year-old, about the size of a four-year-old here, with his hand blown off by a bomb fragment and a little sock over the stump. He was all alone, an orphan leaning against a fence post. As I met his eye, I know that my glance showed guilt as well as, as, well as pity. And that guilt is not only for us killers in the war, but it is on the American people at home, unless steps are taken now to see that we don't promptly have another war. Those steps are, one, a firm national policy directed toward fair dealings with nations and establishments, not only of a better America, but a better, war, a better world. Two, a sound national defense establishment capable of rapid expansion and equipped with the most modern equipment. It should be small but mobile, and this means prepared, equipped, and supplied bases throughout the world. Three, universal uh, military training as a means to rapid expansion if required. Four, a continuation of all-out scientific development so we lead the world in technology as well as tactics. This technolo technological development will have commercial as well as military applications and will therefore assure our commercial position and place in the world. We want peace, and the only way we can assure peace, human nature being what it is, is to have the means of imposing our will on any misguided minority who want war. 
In the meantime, we should try to improve the world spiritually, get away from the law of expediency, and back to the golden rule. This, however, is a long process and may well take decades, generations, or centuries. In the meantime, while doing our good works, I saw another little Okinawan kid with his entire right side in a plaster cast, but ambulatory, holding on to the index finger of a medical sergeant with his good hand and looking up to him with a look of consummate confidence in his new friend and protector. They were both just standing there. It might have appeared to the unobservant that the sergeant wasn't getting his work done, but he was. He was doing the finest job that a human can do, being kind and fair and friendly in the truest sense of the term. He had no possible reward, except that he knew, subconsciously perhaps, that he was making the world just a tiny bit better and the war just infinitesimally a bit more remote. We must realize that nations are groups of individuals, and individuals will fight, so will nations, more readily, as a matter of fact, if incited by mass hysteria, which can be induced by carefully arranged and controlled propaganda. We no longer have geographic isolation from Europe and Asia. Scientific development of the future will bring all parts of the world relatively closer together, will shrink us further. Someday, I hope, we can disband our military establishment and devote ourselves wholly to truly constructive pursuits. But until that time comes, let us do everything possible to so train our children and direct our nation as to give them the both highest possible degree of security in the world in which they find themselves. Quite a lecture. Love, Jim. Thank you, John. Um, I'd like to ask Air Commodore Reefman to come to the stage for a, uh, a closing note on the evening we've had and a, a special message from the Kingdom of the Netherlands. <clears throat> Veterans, ladies and gentlemen, um, I was here to make a presentation to show my, to show the Dutch gratitude for all that happened at the end of the World, the world War II. But first, uh, Hank, sir, let me uh, reply to what you said, we are no heroes. I'd just like to take two minutes for that to give a little reply. When the world was on fire, America stood up and took action. The men, but also the women, I realized there were more than six million roses, as you call them, and we've seen their beautiful images on the wall this afternoon. What I see with America, you're a country of peace-loving men and women. You work hard at it. You realize that liberty cannot be taken for granted. You have to work at it. And need be, sir, you have to fight for it. And that's what you did. That's what your generation did. And perhaps you don't see yourself as heroes. I'm fine with that. But for me and many in the audience, your generation of heroes. Thank you for your cadet. The second part, and that will be, will be my closing remarks. At the end of April, beginning of May, as was said already in many, many uh, ways, my country was starving. And we had angels from the air who dropped food and helped the starving populations. And there's still, luckily, many members of the Hansard Bomber Group who participated in that with many, many partners around with us today. And 
I, as a representative for the Netherlands, like to show my appreciation, our appreciation, the Dutch appreciation for what you did for my people in those days. And I thought, well, you have such beautiful museums in America and Great Britain where they commemorate what had happened in the war. The bad that was necessary and the good that at times was even more necessary. And then I refer to Operation Chowhound and Mana, of course. And I thought it would be fitting to have something that will be there for people to look at. And they will recognize who were there, who participated, and they will recognize the Dutch do show their gratitude to those who brought the needed food. And I'd like to have that plate, please, uh, Mark, if I may. I will show it to you. This plate will go to three museums. And if, what it says, presented to the veterans of the 8th United States Army Air Force, Operation Chowhound, first to the 8th of May, 1945. We will never forget. Thank you, gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, called to the stage, I like Dr. Vivian. Rogers Price, representing the Mighty 8th Air Force Museum from Savannah, Georgia. Vivian Repre Price from the Mighty 8th Air Force in Savannah. There we go. Representing the National World War II Museum, the President and CEO. Oh, you're here already. I'm here. Dr. Nick Muller. Huh? And lastly, representing the 100th Bomb Group Foundation, Ron and Carol Batley from the U United Kingdom, representing the Thorpe Abbott's Tower. <laughs> And President, and President Dan Rosenthal. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank Air Commodore on behalf of the museum. Oh, Ron, we want a photo. You got to get back up there, sir. <laughs> on behalf of Dr. Mueller and the museum, this has been a, uh, a pleasure and certainly an honor to host the 100th Bomb Group here. Uh, we are delighted to have so many of our uh, treasured, our most treasured artifacts, our veterans here with us. Uh, but also the second and third generation. This is important for you all to carry on their story. Uh, thank you to the Commodore. Thank you to Mark Copeland here for moderating this evening's program. Of course, thank you to Hans, the noted historian, and last and certainly not least, our veterans who contributed to the panel.